I wanted them to hear. Baby, <laughs> boo boo. Baby, boo boo. Ooh. Beep, 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 boo boo. How did we do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty whack. Wow. We're the same person. <clears throat> hey. How's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside. And welcome back to another episode of Harry Potter. Whoa, what? <laughs> Inheritance. Surprise. <laughs> um, I don't know why I thought you were going to say, hey, little cuties. I had a weird fucking... Hey, little cuties. Demi Bobemi here. And welcome back to another Rags to Royalty. Oh my God. Okay. That's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you want to just start us off with a Demi's recap? It's going to be a no from me, dog. Oh, I found out Google Timer is, like, not accurate at all. I saw that. That was, like, a few seconds off. It was, like, five seconds. Unless it doesn't really start when it says it's starting. She said now. She did say now, which insinuates that she would be starting now. <laughs> so. What did we learn today? Fuck Google. <laughs> Google's a bitch. I wish we could rename her to, to bitch. What? <laughs> <laughs> or just pee pee poo poo. Karen. Hey pee pee poo. Hey Karen. <laughs> what if she responded? I'd fucking vomit. And she was like, I can't do that. I'm listening to Kids Bop. <laughs> <laughs> the bitch has ho in the f- back seat. <laughs> <laughs> They're listening to Kids Bop. They can't hear me. <laughs> They're listening to Kids Bop. <laughs> that is, I can't, it's too much. Demi's recap, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> go. Um. Oh my God, guess what? Aragon's alive and so is Aria. And except they're in manacles and they're all tied up. And um, for some reason, CP decided to tell us that Aragon's half naked. And then, oh my God, what's happening? He did. Don't worry. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> All these priests come in. Turns out it's not Galbatorix in the first place. It's the fucking Dress Leona people. And they're like, hey, guess what? We have all of these Razak eggs and they're going to eat you. And by all of them, I mean two. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of the Dress Leona people. The entire city of Dress Leona went down and had the Razak eggs in this recap. This one, this recap... <laughs> It's going to be a no from me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> this recap is one for the vaults. <laughs> Whoa, I feel like you were just interacting with me too much. Like, there was like... Oh, it's my fault. Yeah, it's oh, okay. your fault. You were giving me too much engagement. That sounds a little hysterical to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking hysterical. I'm like literally fucking crying right now. I don't know. I was just laughing so hard my eyes were watering. Rolls reversed. If I would have been like, <laughs> I'm like crying right now. And if you're like, about what? I'd have been like, life. <laughs> <laughs> We're just two different people. It reminds me of the one time that um, I was playing with Erlia and Pariah, I think. And Pariah like told a joke. And I was like, I got a pretty good joke. And they're like, yeah, let's hear it. And I was like, my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that. I think I was watching and I laughed. Yeah. Got him. No one was expecting that. That's what you call subverting expectations. Chapter 30. Infidels on the loose. Oh, hell yeah. Very die cast in use. <laughs> what an idiot, proclaimed Angela as she hurried to the edge of the pattern disc <laughs> on the floor. My girl. <laughs> <laughs> she was bleeding from a number of cuts and scratches, and her clothes were stained with even more blood, which Aragon su- suspected, which Aragon suspected, was not her own. What a fucking badass, dude. Otherwise, she appeared unharmed. All he had to do was this, and she swung her sword with its transparent blade up and over her head and brought the pommel down against one of the amethysts that ringed the disc. The crystal shattered with an odd snap, like a shock of static, and the light it emitted flickered and went out. The other crystals maintained their radiance. Without pause, Angela stepped to the next piece of amethyst and broke it as well. Then the one after it. And so on. How many of these are there? Like, this feels like for dramatic I'm just going to guess there's five. Oh, I guess she still has to let them out. I forgot they were still trapped in the fucking magic bubble. Magic bubble. Magic bubble. Magic bubble. 
Never in his life had Aragon been so grateful to see anyone. He alternated between watching the herbalist and watching the cracks widening at the top of the first egg. The Razak had almost pecked its way out. A fact it seemed to be aware of, for it was squawking and tapping with increased vigor. Between the pieces of shell, Aragon saw a thick white membrane and the beaked head of the Razak pushing blindly against it. Horrible and monstrous. It's like a little baby monster, though. It's kind of cute. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, like, most baby anythings are cute, right? I mean, that's like the whole thing is so that nobody wants to kill it because it's a baby and it's cute. I think we're going to get somewhat of a... A real CP detailed... um, Yeah, we're going to get some fucking... Hell yeah. Like, the detail starts here and it ends over here. So, like, almost a whole page of detail. Hell yeah, dude. Buckle in. Oh. Enjoy it. (laughs) Enjoy it. Hurry, hurry, Aragon thought, as a fragment, as large as his hand, fell from the egg and clattered against the floor, like a plate made of fired clay. The membrane tore, and the young Razak stuck its head out of the egg, revealing its barbed purple tongue as it uttered a triumphant screech. Just real quick. I imagine it being like a raptor screech. When it says barbed, what do you imagine? Like a giraffe tongue. That's purple. When I when it says barbed, what do you imagine? I thought giraffes had barbed tongues. Giraffes have just have long purple tongues. I don't think they're barbed. Hey Google, do giraffes have barbed tongues? That didn't answer my question, but I don't think they have barbed tongues. They just have purple oh. ones. I'm just wondering if we're imagining the same thing. They're f- prehensal, not barbed. I picture rogue with spikes or a tongue with spikes. What's a barbed tongue? Well, no, I'm, I don't know. I'm oh. just wondering. I just want to know what you I thought f- you knew that you were. I'm not doing a thing. I'm not doing a bit. I just want to know what you're imagining. Cause I was just thinking like, I'm imagining it with like spikes all over it. And then I was Your like, whole life's a bit rude. Barbed tongue is like a cat tongue or a penguin tongue. Oh, what's a penguin tongue look like? Like that? Ew, that's even worse. I love it. Okay. That's better. And they are, they are supposed to be like bird-like creatures, so. Okay. I forgot how horrifying penguin tongues are. And cat tongues. This is what I think of. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of initially? Because I just thought of like little spikies everywhere. I don't know. I just thought of like of a lumpy tongue, to be honest. I wasn't really thinking about it. Oh, okay. I guess I'm really, like, into these fucking tongues. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, you are. (laughs) Great. Slime dripped from its carapace, and a fungus-like smell pervaded the chamber. Aragon tugged at his bonds once more, futile as it was. Futile or futile? I say futile. Futile. Sounds more dramatic, but I don't know if that's actually how it's pronounced. There were many fatalities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it just sounds better. The Razak screeched again. <laughs> <laughs> what? Nothing, I just love it. Then, struggled to extricate itself from the remainder of the egg. It pulled one clawed arm free, but in the process, it unbalanced the egg, which tipped to one side, spilling a thick, yellowish fluid across the patterned disc. The grotesque hatchling lay on its side for a moment, stunned. Then it stirred and got to its feet, where it stood, swaying and uncertain, clicking to itself like an agitated insect. Aragon stared, appalled and terrified, but also fascinated. The Razak had a deep, ridged chest that made it look as if its ribs were on the outside of its body, not the inside. Ew, weird. The creature's limbs were thin and knobbly, like sticks, and its waist was narrower than any human's. Each leg had an extra backward-bending joint, something that Aragon had never seen before, but which accounted for the Razak's unsettling gait. Its carapace appeared soft and malleable, unlike those of the more mature Razak Aragon had encountered. No doubt it would harden in time. So basically looks like... a dog on its hind legs? Type of body shape? Yeah, probably. (laughs) Bending back, yeah. Um, I don't know if this is super fucking obscure... But I have a memory of a movie, and at the end, it turned out this kid was like an alien, and he went, 
and then crunked back both of his legs. And so his knees were like backwards and then he ran away. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? No. To anyone. <laughs> but that's what I, uh, it reminded me of was that scene. I think I remember seeing a scene like that and the CGI was so bad that when they like broke back their legs, they like didn't maintain the same leg length. Their legs like got, got bigger. Really long. Yeah. And it was like, that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think we're thinking of the same thing. Because it was like weird fucking bizarre CGI and then he just like ran off into the sunset with his weird fake legs. Yeah. <clears throat> the Razak tilted its head, its huge protruding pupilless eyes catching the light and it chittered as if it had just discovered something exciting. Then it took a tentative step toward Arya and another and then another, its beak parting as it strained toward the pool of blood by her feet. Aragon shouted into his gag, hoping to distract the creature, but other than a quick glance, it ignored him. Now, exclaimed Angela, and she broke the last of the crystals. Even as the shards of amethyst skittered across the floor, Solombom leapt toward the Razak. The werecat's form blurred in midair, head shrinking, legs shortening, fur sprouting, and he landed on all fours, his body once more that of an animal. The Razak hissed and clawed at Solombom but the werecat dodged the blow, and faster than the eye could follow, slapped the Razak's head with one of his large, heavy paws. The Razak's neck broke with a crack, and the creature flew across the room and landed in a twisted heap where it lay twitching for several seconds. Um, kind of makes me sad. I know they're, like, the bad guys. It was just a baby. But, like, it's just a baby. Like, it doesn't know. It's literally just following its instincts. It has no... No moral, ethical compass. It's hungry. You know what I mean? It Maybe just, they can make it into a good Razak. That just makes me really sad. Because it's not like it's done anything wrong. It doesn't know. It's yeah. like literally just doing what its body is telling it to do. But what if it's inherently evil? Because like the Urgles were supposedly like evil beings, mm -hmm. like but they're just like warlike people. Like maybe the Razak aren't inherently evil beings. Maybe they're just like they like decay and decomposition and shit like that like they're into that that's like their aesthetic so like <laughs> oh, yeah you know that doesn't make them bad um yeah i don't right i don't know because like to be evil insinuates some sort of a moral compass right probably but in but a newborn animal has no i don't think animals have moral compasses to begin with i think that's kind of like a human thing i know they're a humanoid but like I don't know. They're definitely intelligent. Yeah, they're intelligent. So it's like, could you not like have just raised them or like, I don't know. Raise the baby says your own. Sometimes I just think about stories and I'm like, <clears throat> what, if we heard it from the other point of view, like Aragon would be the bad guy, you know? Maybe, yeah. Solombum hissed, his one uninjured ear pressed flat against his skull. Then he wriggled out of the loincloth that was still tied around his hips and went over to sit and wait by the other egg. What have you done to yourself, said Angela as she hurried over to Arya. Arya warily lifted her Arya warily lifted her head, but she made no attempt to answer. With three swift strokes of her colorless blade, the herbalist sliced through Arya's remaining cuffs, as if the tempered metal were no harder than cheese. Arya fell to her knees and doubled over, pressing her injured hand against her stomach. With her other hand she tore at her gag. The burning in Aragon's shoulders eased when Angela cut him free, and he was finally able to lower his arms. He pulled the cloth out of his mouth and in a hoarse voice said, We thought you were dead. They'll have to try harder than that if they want to kill me. Bunglers, the lot of them. <laughs> I love her, and then I was just thinking when you said colorless blade, and I was like, you know what you can do to things that are color colorless? You could add color to them. Like the color green, maybe like retemper it or something like reforge it yeah maybe in the color green why no reason just arbitrarily picking the color green hmm interesting huh. there's a book cover at <laughs> <laughs> still doubled still doubled over Arya began to chant spells of binding and healing her words were soft and strained but she never faltered or misspoke while she worked to repair the damage to her hand, Aragon healed the cut on his ribs as well as the sores of, on his wrists. Then he motioned to Solombum and said, Move. The werecat flicked his tail but did as Aragon asked. 
Lifting his right hand, Aragon said, Brisinger! A pillar of blue flame erupted around the second egg. The creature inside screamed, a terrible, unearthly sound, more like the screech of tearing metal than the cry of a person or beast. Narrowing his eyes against the heat, Aragon watched with satisfaction as the egg burned. And let that be the last of them, he thought. When the screaming ceased, he extinguished the flame, and it went out from the bottom up. The silence afterward was unexpectedly complete, for Arya had finished her incantations, and all was still. Angela was the first to stir. She went to Solombum and stood over him, murmuring in the ancient language as she mended his ear and other wounds. Aragon knelt by Arya and put a hand on her shoulder. She looked up at him, then uncurled her body enough to show him her hand, the skin along the lower third of her thumb, as well as along the outer edge of her palm, and across the back of her hand was shiny and bright red. However, the muscles underneath appeared sound. Why didn't you finish healing it, he asked. If you're too tired, I can. She shook her head. I damaged several nerves, and I can't seem to repair them. I need Bloodgarm's help. He is more skilled than I at manipulating flesh. Can you fight? If I'm careful. He tightened his grip on her shoulder for a moment. What you did. I only did what was logical. Most people wouldn't have had the strength. I tried, but my hand was too big. See? And he held up his hand against hers. She nodded, then grasped his arm and slowly got to her feet. Aragon rose with her, providing her with a steady support. We have to find our weapons, he said, as well as my ring, my belt, and the necklace the dwarves gave me. Angela frowned. Why your belt? Is it enchanted? When Aragon hesitated, unsure whether to tell her the truth, Arya said, You would not know the name of its maker, wise one, but during your travels... You must surely have heard tell of the belt of the twelve stars. Wait, what? Oh, Angela was asking, okay. And okay. Arya was responding to Angela. Oh, okay. <clears throat> For some reason, I thought Arya was asking. I was like, fucking Arya knows. Yeah, I was like, wait, what the fuck? But It was Angela that asked, why, why your belt? Is it enchanted? And then... Aragon hesitated, and Arya said, You would not know the name of its maker, wise one, but during your travels, you must surely have heard tell of the belt of the twelve stars. The herbalist's eyes widened. That belt? But I thought it was lost over four centuries ago. Destroyed during the... We recovered it, said Arya flatly. <laughs> Aragon could see that the herbalist longed to ask more questions, but she merely said, I see. We can't waste time searching every room in this warren, though. Once the priests realize you've escaped, we'll have the whole pack of them nipping at our heels. Aragon motioned toward the novitiate on the floor and said, maybe he can tell us where they took our things. Dropping into a squat, the herbalist placed two fingers against the youth's jugular vein, feeling his pulse. Then she slapped his cheeks and peeled back his eyelids. I just imagine her spanking him, like whipping up his robe and be like, (laughs) slapping his cheeks. Yeah, slapping his butt cheeks. Oh my god. I'm waking him up that way. I fucking hope so. That's how I'm gonna imagine it. Oh, whoa. Alright, chill out. The novice shit remained slack and motionless. His lack of response seemed to annoy the herbalist. One moment, she said, closing her eyes. A, sight, a slight frown creased her brow. For a while she was still, then she sprang upward with sudden speed. What a self absorbed little wretch! No wonder his parents sent him to join the priests. I'm surprised they put up with him as long as they did. Does he know anything of use? Asked Aragon. Only the path to the surface. She pointed toward the door to the left of the altar. The same door through which the priest had entered and departed. It's amazing that he tried to free you. I suspect it's the first time in his life he's ever done anything of his own accord. We have to bring him with us. Aragon hated to say it, but duty compelled him. I promised we would if he helped us. He tried to kill you. I gave my word. Angela sighed and rolled her eyes. <laughs> to Arya, she said, I don't suppose you can convince him otherwise. Arya shook her head, then hoisted the young man onto her shoulder without apparent effort. I'll carry him, she said. In that case, the herbalist said to Aragon, you had best have this, since it seems that you and I are to do the most of the fighting. She handed him her short sword, then drew a ponier- poniard with a jeweled hilt from within the folds of her dress. <laughs> Whoa, fuck. Dude, what the fuck? What else she got in there? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, Ponyard is like 
a tiny little, right? Like a rapier almost. Yeah, I thought so. Right? But I don't you know. You got your phone? You got a picture? Ooh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. It's like, it's like Electra ones. Oh, never mind. Electra? Electra. Look up Electra. But like she doesn't. Carmen Electra? <clears throat> no, L E K T R A. But I don't think she has poniards either. I think she has something else. I can't remember the name though. What is it made of? Aragon asked as he peered through the transparent blade of the sword, noticing how it caught and reflected the light. The substance reminded him of diamond, but he could not imagine that anyone would make a weapon out of a gemstone. The amount of energy required to keep the stone from breaking with every blow would soon exhaust any normal magician. Neither stone nor metal, said the herbalist. A word of caution, though. You must take great care when handling it. Never touch the edge or allow anything you cherish to come near it. Else you will regret it. You're going to regret it. <laughs> Likewise, never lean the sword against something you might need. Your leg, for example. <laughs> Wary, Aragon held the sword farther away from his body. Why? Because, said the herbalist with evident relish, this is the sharpest blade in all of existence. No other sword or knife or axe can match the keenness of its edge. Not even Brisinger. It is the ultimate embodiment of an incision-making instrument. This, she paused for emphasis, <laughs> is the archetype of an inclined plane. You'll not find its equal anywhere. It can cut through anything not protected by magic and many things that are. Try it if you don't believe me. Aragon looked around for something to test the sword against. The kid. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, he strode over to the altar and swung the blade at one corner of the stone slab. Not so quickly, cried Angela. The transparent blade passed through four inches of stone as if the granite were no harder than custard, then continued down toward his feet. Aragon yelped and jumped back, barely managing to stop his arm before he cut himself. The corner of the altar bounced off the step below and tumbled cackling, clacking toward the middle of the room. The rock was cackling. <laughs> the blade of the sword Aragon realized might very well be diamond after all. It would not need as much protection as he had assumed since it, since it would rarely meet with any substan since it would rarely meet with any substantial resistance. Here, said Angela, you'd better have this as well. She unbuckled the sword scabbard and gave it to him. It's one of the few things you can't cut with that blade. It took Aragon a moment to find his voice after so nearly lopping off his toes. Does the sword have a name? Angela laughed. Of course. In the ancient language, its name is Albiter, which means exactly what you think. But I prefer to call it Tinkle Death. Tinkle Death? Yes, because of the second... Because of the sound the blade makes when you tap it, she demonstrated with the tip of a fingernail and smiled as the resulting high-pitched note that pierced the darkened chamber like a ray of sunshine. Now then, <laughs> shall we be off? What does a ray of sunshine sound like? <laughs> Tinkling, I guess. I don't know. You think it was like a ting sound or was it like a <laughs> sound? <laughs> like the sound of opening a treasure chest in a video game? I was thinking more of like chimes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all I can hear is the sound of cicadas when I think of like sunshine, so I don't really know. <laughs> Interesting. So in Demi's mind, she tapped it and it went. <laughs> <laughs> Aragon checked to make sure they were not forgetting anything. Then he nodded, strode to the left hand door and opened it as quietly as he could. Through the doorway was a long, broad hallway lit by torches, and standing guard in two smart rows, one along each side of the hallway, were twenty of the black garbed warriors who had ambushed them earlier. They looked at Aragon and reached for their weapons. A curse ran through Aragon's mind, and he sprang forward, intending to attack before the warriors could draw their swords and organize themselves into an effective group. He had only covered a few feet, however, when a flicker of movement appeared next to each man, a soft, shadowy blur like the motion of a wind-blown pennant seen at the edge of his vision. Without so much as a single cry, the twenty men stifened and fell to the floor, dead, every last one of them. Alarmed, Aragon slowed to a stop before he ran into the bodies. Each of the men had been stabbed through an eye, as neat as could be. 
He turned to ask Ari and Angela if they knew what had happened, but the words died in his throat as he beheld the herbalist. She stood braced against a wall, leaning on her knees and panting heavily. Her skin had gone deathly white, and her hands were shaking. Blood dripped from her poniard. Awe and fear filled Aragon. Whatever the herbalist had done, it was beyond his understanding. She's spooky. Wise one, said Arya, and she too sounded uncertain. How did you manage to do this? The herbalist chuckled between breaths, then said, I used a trick. <laughs> I learned from my master, Tenga, ages ago. May a thousand spiders bite his ears and knobbly bits. Rude. Yeah, yes, but how did you do it, insisted Aragon. A trick like that might be useful in Uruban. The herbalist chuckled again. What is time but motion? And what is motion but heat? And are not heat and energy but different names for the same thing? She pushed herself off the wall, walked over to Aragon, and patted him on the cheek. When you understand the implications of that, you'll understand how and what I did. I won't be able to use that spell again today, not without hurting myself, so don't expect me to kill everyone the next time we run into a batch of men. With some difficulty, Aragon swallowed his curiosity and nodded. What? So it was basically a cooldown. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fucking 20 Do you want me to read cooldown. that again? or? Well, I'm not like confused by her necessarily, but like her just like, why we got to go science-y? Why can't we just leave it fantasy magic time? Because it's energy manipulation, I guess. I don't know. Wasn't it like Tango kind of like science and shit? I don't know. I just remember that he was crotchety and like living by himself. He was very crotchety. May a thousand spiders bite his ears and knobbly bits. That's a little rude, I feel like, but whatever. <clears throat> That's what Angela said. I know. It's just a little rude. He stripped a tunic and patted Jerkin off one of the fallen men, and after donning the clothes, he led the way down the hall and through the archway at the far end. They encountered no one else in the complex of rooms and corridors thereafter, nor did they find any sign of their stolen position, possessions. Although Aragon was glad to avoid notice, the absence of even servants worried him. He hoped that he and his companions had not triggered alarms and had warned the priests of their escape. Unlike the abandoned chambers that they had seen before, the ambush, those they passed through now were filled with tapestries, furniture, and strange devices made of brass and crystal, the purpose of which Aragon could not fathom. More than once, a desk or a bookcase tempted, tempted him to pause and inspect its contents, but he always resisted the urge. They did not have time to read musty old papers, no matter how intriguing. Angela chose a path they took whenever there was more than one option, but Aragon remained in the lead, clutching the wire-wrapped hilt of Tinkle Death with a grip so hard his hand began to cramp. Soon enough, they arrived at a passageway ending in a flight of stone steps that narrowed as it rose. Two novice shits stood by the stairs, one on either side, each holding a rack of bells, such as Aragon had seen earlier. He ran at the two young men and managed to stab one novice shit through the neck before he could shout or ring his bells. The other, however, had time to do both before Solombum leaped on him and bore him to the ground, tearing at his face and the whole of the passageway rang with the clamor. Hurry, Aragon cried as he bounded up the stairs. At the top of the steps was a freestanding wall some ten feet wide, covered with ornate scrollwork and carvings that seemed vaguely familiar to Aragon. He dodged around the wall and came out into a beam of rose-tinted light of such intensity that he faltered. Confused, he lifted Tinkle Death's scabbard to shade his eyes. Not five feet in front of him, the high priest sat on its bier, blood dripping from a cut on its shoulder. Another of the priests, a woman, missing both of her hands, sat kneeling by the side of the bier, catching the falling blood, and a golden chalice that she held clamped between her forearms. Both he and the both she and the high priest stared at Aragon with astonishment. Then Aragon looked past him and saw, as in a series of lightning flashes, massive ribbed columns rising toward a vaulted ceiling that vanished into shadow, stained glass windows set within towering walls, the windows on the left burning with light from the rising sun, those on the right dull and flat, lifeless. Pale statues standing between the windows, rows of granite pews, 
dappled with different colors extending all the way to the far-off entrance to the nave and filling the first four rows a flock of leather-garbed priests, their face upturned and their mouths opened in song like so many hatchlings begging for food. <sighs> wow, that was very descriptive. He was, Aragon belatedly realized, standing in the great cathedral of Dras Leona on the other side of the altar he had once knelt before in reverence long ago. Literally could have just said that. I just... <laughs> I have to say, like, I appreciate that CP has this, like, so thoroughly thought out and that he has, like, a specific vision but wow, it's really overwhelming. <laughs> it's uh, definitely overwhelming too, like reading other authors. Because like I was reading Gaijing today. Mm -hmm. And it's just such different writing. It's insane. Just wow. <sighs> the handless woman dropped the chalice and stood, throwing her arms out wide as she shielded the high priest with her body. Behind her, Aragon glimpsed the blue of Bersinger's sheath lying near the leading edge of the bier, and he thought he saw R next to it. Before he could chase after his sword, two guards rushed toward him from either side of the altar, slashing at him with engraved red tasseled pikes. He sidestepped the first guard and sliced the shaft of the man's pike in half, sending the blade flying through the air. Then Aragon sliced the man himself in half. <laughs> Tinkle death passed through his flesh and bones with shocking ease. Damn, it's fucking OP. Yeah, it seems like Tinkle Death would be able to just slice through everyone's shield, like everything. Yeah. It would just be easy, just be like, beep, 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 in front of you, and then everybody dead. They should, like, use Tinkle Death to go up against Galbatorix, because it yeah. could, if it can slice through Basinger, then it could slice through Xerox, it could slice through Galbatorix's sword. I guess, like, as long as it's not protected by magic in any way. That's what Angela said. Yeah. But she said it can go through things that, unless it's protected by magic, and even through some things that are. Mm, okay. And then she also said it could slice through Basinger. Okay. That's probably protected by magic. That 100%. <laughs> I mean, it's an enchanted blade. It's fair. <clears throat> he doesn't need to sharpen it ever. It literally catches fire <laughs> when he says the word Brisinger. So, <laughs> stands to reason it's magic. I don't know. I think it's still up for debate, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Aragon dispatched the second guard just as quickly and turned to face a pair approaching from behind. The herbalist joined him, brandishing her poniard, and somewhere off to his left, Solombom growled. Arya hung back from the fighting, still carrying the young man. The spilled blood from the chalice had coated the floor around the altar. The guard slipped in the puddle, and the rear man fell and knocked his companion off his feet. Aragon shuffled toward them, never lifting his feet off the floor so as to avoid losing his balance, and before the guards could react, he slew them both, taking care to control the herbalist enchanted blade as it effortlessly cut through the two men. As he did, Aragon was aware that the high priest was screaming as if at a great distance, Kill the infidels! Kill them! Don't let the blasphemers escape! They must be punished for their crimes against the old ones! The congregation of priests began to howl and stamp their feet, and Aragon felt their minds clawing at his like a pack of wolves tearing at a weakened deer. He retreated deep within himself, warding off the attacks with techniques he had been practicing under Glader's tutelage. It was difficult to defend himself from so many foes, however, and he feared that he would not be able to maintain his barriers for long. His one advantage was that the panicked, disorganized priests attacked him as individuals, not as a unit. Their combined might would have overwhelmed him. Wow, that's lucky for him. Then Arya's consciousness was pressing against his, a familiar, comforting, a familiar, comforting presence amid the clutch of enemies scrabbling against his inner self. Relieved, he opened himself to her, and they joined their minds, even as he and Sephira would do, and for a time, their identities merged, and he lost the ability to determine where many of their shared thoughts and feelings came from. Together, they stabbed with their minds at one of the priests. The man struggled to evade their grasp, like a fish wriggling through their fingers, but they tightened their grip 
and refused to let him escape. He was reciting a stilted, oddly worded phrase in an attempt to keep them out of his consciousness. Aragon assumed it was a scrap of scripture from the Book of Tosk. The priest lacked discipline, however, and his concentration soon wavered as he thought, The infidels are too close to master. We have to kill them before... Wait! No! No! <laughs> what? I love that stupid voice he gave him. Thanks. Aragon and Arya seized upon the priest's weakness and quickly subjugated the man's thought to their will. Once they were certain he could not retaliate against them with mind or body, Arya cast a spell that, from examining the priest's memories, she knew would slip past his wards. In the third row of pews, a man screamed and burst into flame, green fire pouring from his ears, mouth, and eyes. The flames ignited the clothes of several priests close to him, and the burning men and women began to thrash and run about wildly, further disrupting the attacks against Aragon. The rippling flames sounded like branches snapping in a storm. Wait, where did the fire come from? Arya and Aragon's <clears throat> brain power? Yeah. Okay. Well, Arya casts a spell. Okay. The herbalist ran down from the altar and moved among the priests, stabbing here and there. Just... <laughs> Not killing anybody, just stabbing them. Just stabbing around, just in case. Solemn Bum followed close at her heels, finishing off those she felled. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> she was just... <laughs> just bing bong bong. <clears throat> and then Solemn Bum's just clinging up afterward. Fink fong. After that, it was easy for Aragon and Arya to invade and seize control of their enemies' minds. Continuing to work together, they killed four more priests, at which point the rest of the congregation broke and scattered. Some fled through the vestibule that Aragon remembered led to the priory next to the cathedral, while others crouched behind the pews and wrapped their arms around their heads. Six of the priests, however, neither fled nor hid, but rather charged Aragon, brandishing curved knives with what hands they still possessed. Aragon cut at the first priest before he could strike at him. To his annoyance, the woman was protected by a ward that stopped Tinkle Death half a foot from her neck, causing the sword to turn in his hand and a shock to run up his arm. With his left hand, Aragon swung at the woman. For whatever reason, the spell did not stop his fist, and he felt the bones in her chest give way as he knocked her sprawling into the people behind her. The remaining priests extricated themselves and resumed their charge. Stepping forward, Aragon blocked a clumsy slash from the foremost priest, then with a shot of HA! He drove his fist into the man's gut and sent him flying into a pew, which the priest struck with a nasty crack. Aragon killed the next man in a similar manner. A green and yellow dart buried itself in the throat of the priest to his right, and there was a tawny blur as Solombum leaped past him and tackled another of the group. Wait, did he just, like, fucking one-punch him? One punch! <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're just dead? Well, I mean, yeah. He's, okay. he's like, okay. elf boy now, remember? He's a fucking elf boy, I get it. He's, like, as strong as an elf, and these are just weak little humans. And they're, like, not even entire humans. They're just partial humans. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, parts of humans. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah. I mean, they're not made up of parts of humans. I mean, they are human themselves. Right. And then they've hacked parts off of them. Yeah, they're just parts of But they're of still human. human. They're still human. Yeah. They're like, if you cut your arm off, are you any less human? No, you're still human. I'm just, like... It doesn't change, like, the strength of your <laughs> chest cavity or anything. What else are they doing to themselves, you know? They're, like, chopping their limbs off. They can't be healthy. I think they're removing their ribs. Maybe. Marilyn Manson did it. <laughs> <laughs> that left but one of Tosk's followers standing before him. With her free hand, Arya grabbed the woman by the front of her leather robes and threw her screaming 30 feet over the pews. Four novitiates had lifted up the high priest's beer and were carrying it at a quick trot along the east side of the cathedral as they headed toward the front entrance of the building. Seeing them escaping, Aragon uttered a roar and bounded into the altar, knocking a plate and goblet to the floor. From there, he jumped out over the bodies of the fallen priests. He landed lightly in the aisle and sprinted to the end of the cathedral, heading off the novish, novice shits. Novitiates. The four young men stopped when they saw Aragon arrive at the doors. Turn around, shrieked the high priest. Turn around! Its servants obeyed, only to be confronted by Arya standing behind them, one of their own slung over her right shoulder. The novitiates yelped and turned sideways, darting between rows of pews. Before they had gone more than a few feet, Solombum stepped 
around the end of the pews and began to pad toward them. The werecat's ears were pressed flat against his skull, and the constant low rumble of his growl made Aragon's neck prickle. <laughs> I know there's probably supposed to be more like bobcats or like a wild cat, but I just think of them as like house cats. <laughs> it's like not intimidating. I'm pretty sure there was a thing where it said like Solemnum hissed. Yeah. And I just imagine like <laughs> Close behind him came Angela, striding down the cathedral from the altar, her poniard in one hand and a green and yellow dart in the other. Aragon wondered how many weapons she had about herself. <laughs> to their credit, the novitiates did not lose their courage or abandon their master. Instead, the four shouted and ran even faster at Solombum, presumably because the werecat was the smallest and the closest of their opponents, and because they believed he would be the easiest to overcome. They were mistaken. It was admirable. But foolish. <laughs> In a single lithe movement, Solombum crouched, jumped from the floor to the top of a pew. Then without stopping, he leapt toward one of the two lead novitiates. As a work hat sailed through the air, the high priest shouted something in the ancient language. Aragon did not recognize the word, but the sound of it was unmistakably that of the elves' native language. Whatever the spell was, it seemed to have no effect on Solombum, although Aragon saw Angela stumble as if she had been struck. Solombum collided with the novitiate at whom he had flung himself, and the young man tumbled to the floor, screaming as Solombum mauled him. The rest of the novish, nov, novitiates tripped over the companion's body, and the lot of them fell into a tangled heap, spilling the high priest off its beer and onto one of the pews, where the creature lay squirming like a maggot. Gross. I don't like that. Said so he freaks me out. He's just like a stump man. He's like a maggot. Stop saying that word. Freaks me out. Grub. <laughs> that just sounds tasty. <laughs> you know, um, like Timon and Pumbaa. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why did I know what you were thinking about? I said grub, and you go, it "Sounds tasty," and I immediately was like, "Timon and Pumbaa, like yeah, I Lion could, King." All I could think of was Timon and Pumbaa, but I was trying to think of the movie name, but my brain just kept going, "Timon and Pumbaa." <laughs> What's the name of that movie? Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> Aragon caught up with them a second later, and with three swift strokes, he slew all of the novitiates, save the one whose neck Solombum had clamped between his jaws. Once Aragon was sure that men were dead, he turned to strike down the high priest once and for all. As he started toward the limbless figure, another mind invaded his, probing and grasping as the most intimate parts of his self, seeking to control his thoughts. The vicious attack forced Aragon to stop and concentrate on defending himself from the intruder. Out of the corner of his eyes, he saw that Arya and Solombum had appeared immobilized. The herbalist was the sole exception. She paused for a moment when the attack commenced, but then she continued to walk with slow, shuffling steps toward Aragon. Um, so what I understand... Stump man has attacked everyone's brains, or at least that's what he's insinuating that he's got the brain power. And he got Arya and Solemn Bum, but not Aragon and Angela. And so, Angela's no, he like, got he got Aragon, he did, yeah. Oh, I thought he was fighting him off. The vicious attack forced Aragon to stop and concentrate on defending himself from the intruder. Oh, so is everyone just concentrating really hard? I guess so. The high priest stared at Aragon. It's deep-set, dark, ringed eyes burning with hate and fury. If the creature had had arms and legs, Aragon was convinced that it would have tried to tear out his heart with its bare hands. As it was, the malevolence of its gaze was so intense, Aragon half expected the priest to wiggle off the pew and start biting at his ankles. The assault on his mind intensified as Angela drew near. The high priest, for it had to be the high priest who was responsible, was far more skilled than any of its underlings. To engage in mental combat with four different people at once, and to present a credible threat to each of the four was a remarkable feat, especially when the enemies were an elf, a dragon rider, a witch, and a werecat. The high priest had one of the most formidable minds Aragon had ever encountered. If not for the help of his companions, Aragon suspected that he would have succumbed to the creature's onslaughts. The priest did things of the likes which Aragon had never experienced before, such as binding Aragon's stray thoughts to Arya's and Solombum's, wrapping them into a knot of such confusion that for brief moments Aragon lost track of his own identity. What? He's fucked when he goes up against Galvatorix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At last, Angela turned into the space between the pews. She picked her way around Solombum, who crouched next to the novitiate he had killed, 
every hair on his body standing on end, and then carefully made her way over the corpses of the three novi novitiates Aragon had slain. As she approached, the high priest began to thrash like a hooked fish in an attempt to push itself farther up the pew. At the same time, the pressure on Aragon's mind lessened, although not enough for him to risk moving. The herbalist stopped when she reached the high priest, and the high priest surprised Aragon by giving up its struggle and lying panting on the seat of the bench. For a minute, the hollow-eyed creature and the short, stern-faced woman glanced at each other, an invisible battle of wills taking place between them. Then the high priest flinched, and a smile appeared on Angela's lips. She dropped her poniard, and from within her dress drew forth a tiny dagger with a blade the color of a ruddy sunset. Why'd she grab an even smaller <clears throat> blade than the one that she had? Does she just have, is it like a Russian nesting doll of like fucking tiny blades? She's just got so many weapons. <laughs> Dude, what the fuck? Leaning over the high priest, she whispered ever so faintly, You ought to know my name, tongueless one. If you had, you never would have dared oppose us. Here, let me tell it to you. Her voice dropped even lower then, too low for Aragon to hear. But as she spoke, the high priest blanched, and its puckered mouth opened, forming a round black oval, and an unearthly howl emanated from its throat, and the whole of the cathedral rang with the creature's baying. Oh, be quiet, exclaimed the herbalist, and she buried her sunset-colored dagger in the center of the high priest's chest. The blade flashed white-hot and vanished with a sound like a th far-off thunderclap. The area around the wound glowed like burning wood. Then skin and flesh began to disintegrate into a fine, dark suit that poured into the high priest's chest. With a choked gargle, the creature's howl ceased as abruptly as it had begun. The spell quickly devoured the rest of the high priest, reducing its body to a pile of black powder, the shape of which matched the outline of the priest's head and torso. And good riddance, said Angela with a firm nod. Who is this woman? <laughs> right? Like, Who is this woman? <laughs> dude, what the fuck? Like, what did she whisper to little stump man? Also, that just reminded me of, um, what's the superhero movie where they all turned into dust? Endgame? No. Nope. Nobody turns into dust in Endgame. Or wait, in Infinity War. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Um. Dude, that fucking <clears throat> ruddy sunset colored blade sounds so fucking cool. She like stabs him. It burns white hot. And then there's like a like far off sound of thunder. That's like so dope. Like was it actually far off sound? It, like, came from somewhere, you know? Ooh. Or was it just, like, it sounded like far off thunder, but, like, close up? It'd be cool if the magic came from somewhere. That'd be else. cool. Like, if it was being powered from, like, somewhere else, like a sort of renewable, like, power source other than Angela herself. Mm -hmm. What the rude. fuck? Uh, Put your phone on Do Not Disturb when we're recording. Okay, chill, man. It's not like I'm super popular and getting fucking texted all the time. <laughs> it was just a stupid Facebook update. Angela's cool. I, she has a whole fucking arsenal up in her dress. I feel like she has, like, uh, garters, mm -hmm. like, on her, like, legs, like, under her dresses, like, her skirts and stuff that just have, like, weapons on them. And like pockets that have things in them. Because um, fun fact, dresses used to be made um, with a sort of hole on the side. Like they tied together in the front and the back. And so there would be like a gap right here in the skirt. So you could actually stick your hand in there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that's where pockets used to be was like a separate purse inside of that. And then into another item was like a pocket or whatever. But then I feel like you could reach down in there and then you could like whip out your weapons. And then she has like a corset or something underneath that has like holsters and shit for weapons. And actually I can't imagine where they're like a corset on. Probably has some sort of a something like a bodice, <laughs> I guess. But with like all these different fucking weapons, <clears throat> she's just going to pull out like a fucking morning star or whatever. 
Can't She'd be like, wait. oh, this is like a magical mor- morning star. Like literally changes the day to night, night to day when you kill somebody with it. I just like can't wait to learn more about her because I have to be honest when everyone's like, oh my God, I love Angela. She's like my favorite character. And I'm like, she's like fun and quirky and like whimsical up until this point. But we didn't really, kn- I didn't know anything about Angela up until this point, you know? Yeah, true. And I'm like, okay, yeah, she's, like, fun and silly and quirky, but, like, she has, like, no... She seems, like, OP as fuck. Yeah, she's fucking way OP. Um, But until this point, she had no... Not, like, no value, but it kind of seemed like she was just a weirdo random character that, like, didn't make any sense. Like, the weirdo random character that's like, I'll read your cards and, like, read your future and here's some dragon knuckle bones for, you know, mystery box convenience, and then she, like, shows back up and you're like... Who are you? What are you doing? Yeah, it seems like But then weird. to show her, like, utility, like, that she's, like, f- that she goes full fucking sicko mode. Hell yeah, dude. I'm like, I get it now. I see what you guys were saying. But... She definitely, like, picked up the pace in this last episode, or in this last book. Yeah. Specifically in this last chapter. There's this, like, so much more mystery around her, especially when she, like, goes up to that high priest and is like, well, I'll tell you my name. I and wish like, Aragon could have just used his fucking supersonic elf ears, his little elf boy ears to hear. I mean, he used a similar spell when he was fighting, or not fighting, but when he was like spying on Braum and Jode. Remember that in the first book? He enhanced his hearing so that he could hear them. Remember? Yeah. Why didn't he just do that there? He'd be like, fuck, I need to know this. Whisper, whisper, my mom. And then, uh-huh. and then just like, boop, 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 boop. all I could think of was like the extendable ears or whatever from Harry Potter. Yeah, you could just whip those out. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't like imagining for some reason him just like hearing really well. I was just imagining him like have one of those like weird little strings from the movie. Yep. Oh, like in the back to the first book, you were imagining him. No, magicking. right now. Oh, right now. Right now, and we're talking about it. Interesting. <laughs> what? I guess he was. Well, doesn't say. I guess he was preoccupied with, like, defending against that dude's mental attack. But you'd think that as soon as Angela like came up and smiled at him, basically that it was like over, and he could have been like, Wish-a-ma-ma. "Yeah, I don't know. I'm just like mad because I want to know. <clears throat> Why doesn't Aragon know so I can know? Because it would have been kind of fun." For us to hear and not know. Yeah, that would have been way more intriguing to me. Unless the name is something that we've heard before in a story of some kind. And that we should. We actually do know who Angela is from like a story that um, Oramus told us or something. I can't think of any stories that Oramus would have told us that would be, the you know, that would be like, oh, that, that could be Angela. I don't know. I'm just maybe. I'm just saying, like, it's possible. You know? Maybe. It's maybe. It's maybe. Spam. It's maybe. <laughs> or if she just leaned in and went, Angela, Bob, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> she just leaned in and said, He wants a peanut butter. He wants a peanut butter. And he's like, <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> I just want more Angela. I mean, I think she has, like, a pretty big part in. The witch and the worm in the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the witch. Wait, what is it? The witch, the bed Fork. knobs and broomsticks? Forks and hoes Forks, or something? Forks, spoons, and sporks? <laughs> I don't fucking know what that <laughs> book's called. I think it's booze, bops, and bookmarks. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> cool. I don't know, man. I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, same, pretty much. Sometimes I have such a hard... <laughs> <laughs> was that you wiping away or fucking... <laughs> what were you wiping away there? I'm like, tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> it's hard because, like, I didn't have any coffee today, right? So I've just been drinking tea, which I is... I didn't have like, any coffee. Listen. Listen. <laughs> so I just had tea, which doesn't have nearly as much caffeine. And so I'm just, like, so tired. And, like, when I'm tired, your voice... You were spacing out too then, weren't you? You just didn't want to say anything. Like there are sometimes it's like 
not like spacing out, but like I can't wait to be editing this and like look <laughs> back and see you being like. But it like lulls me to sleep like a lullaby. Like it feels like a nice like hug. Like <laughs> more like lullaby. <laughs> yeah. So it's like hard, and then also like CP's over fucking. Just it was just like a lot of things all at once, and I was like, good night. I felt like I was gonna fucking fall asleep, and I'm <laughs> reading. You know. <laughs> I mean, like, why is he so descriptive? Because you know what never came into play ever again, and probably never will. The fucking ribbed columns that went up into the fucking sky and disappeared and disappeared because <clears throat> it was such a tall. Like I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> 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 but it was like, I mean, like, I know it was four, three books ago or whatever, four books. The first book was the last time he was in Dras Leona. But, like, you can just say he was in Dras Leona and the pews were filled with devil worshipers. Like, you know, <laughs> like, we we remember that crazy descriptive scene from the first book enough that we remember that Dras Leona has, like, a crazy cathedral, and they've, like, mentioned it a couple times. Like, nothing as great as a cathedral in Dras Leona. Oh, Dras Leona has a great cathedral. Hellgrind, remember that cathedral in Dras Leona? Like, it's not, like, out of memory so much that we need, like, a full description of it again. Even if it was new, I wouldn't need that much of a fucking description. Maybe, yeah. Huh? It's just, like, it's a lot of, like, little tiny detail that I'm, like, you just don't... Like I was saying, it's whack to, like, read another person's writing style. Like, especially somebody that definitely shows and doesn't really tell tell and lets you, mm-hmm. like, gives you what you need to know. But other than that, just, like, kind of, like, puts you in the world and you're, like, going through the world. Yeah. To, like, somebody that's, like, describing the world to you. And it's, like, those descriptive moments are, like, fine. Like, if, and I feel like, those super descriptive moments are really great if the character is in a time and a place where it makes sense and they're like hyper focused and he's giving you all this detail because the character is like really hyper focused on this shit. Like when he was training with Oramis, you know, when he's like trying to look at the landscape and whatever, like that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But when you are like adrenaline, go fucking got to kill people in fucking danger. Like you're not like, oh, look at these ribbed columns that are super tall and go into the ceiling and you can't even like, no, you're in fucking adrenaline. <laughs> you know, like, like what? Ribbed col- oh, wow. And maybe like that's what feels oh, a little bit like whoa. clunky to me is like in moments where it's like super fast. Well, that's just how quick thinking he is. I don't care. I'm not. I'm not an elf. I'm a human. And then it like for me that yeah, you're reading it from the elf's perspective. I'm gonna pluck my eyeballs out. <laughs> <laughs> He's so frustrated. Um, I feel like it makes the pacing weird. For me, it doesn't feel like I'm in the moment with him. Like while they're like running down the corridors, I was like into it. And I'm like, okay, we're like going, bitch. We're like just chopping people down. And it like felt like, okay, this is like normal. And then it was like we came around the corner of that wall. And then it was just like description, fucking central population, fucking Aragon. <clears throat> yeah, that did feel a little jarring that it was like go 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 go, especially with like Angela like stabbing those people, moving mm-hmm. on. We came across these two people, killed them, swift, let's go, move out. And then it's like I do like the pause of like the high priest up on the beer shocked faces. Yeah. That was like a good stop, but then it should have like kind of like gone back into like like that felt like a good point to be like <sighs> Yeah, and then like, like get back into it instead of being like, because <sighs> right, because you'd be like a little bit like tunnel visioned. I would think like you wouldn't be like super like. He did say, in, <clears throat> in the descriptive part, he did say, which I appreciated. I did like. Hang on. Because he said, um, sat kneeling beside, blah, blah, blah. Both she and the high priestess stared at Aragon with astonishment. Then he said, then Aragon looked past them and saw as as if in a series of lightning flashes. Okay. Massive rib columns, stained glass windows, pale statues, 
rows of granite pews. But he just went massive ribbed columns rising toward a vaulted ceiling that vanished into shadow, still stained glass windows set within towering walls, the windows on the left burning with light from the rising sun, those on the right dull and flat, lifeless, pale stat. See that? I think that's like, he's just explaining like the first part and the last part that doesn't really make it feel like a lightning flash. Mm -hmm. Cause if he would have just said like marbles, like marble pillars, going out of view or something yeah like seemingly unending marble <clears throat> or like seemingly unending columns like and then the sunrise shining through the windows to the left like we we know what a sunrise coming through a window would look like yeah reflecting off the right side like we don't need that that doesn't feel like lightning f fast flash that feels like you're going marble up the pillar into nothing sunrise through the window to the lifeless like yeah. whatever on the right like I feel like that was just a little jarring from the previous, like, momentum that we had. Yeah. It's so wet because he does, like, such an amazing, superb job at, like, writing. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, fuck. I think it's hard when he's, like, really passionate about probably, like, a location or a point of interest or something that he's, like, thought a lot about and has sort of, like has this like fantasy of not like a fantasy, but you know what I mean? Like his sort of this vision of what he wants it to look like. And he wants everyone else to see it. It, it does translate so much better when you're just reading it by yourself. <sighs> yeah, that's true. It's so hard out loud. Cause it's like the rhythm is way different out loud. Cause when you read it in your mind and you're not reading it out loud mm -hmm. or hearing it out loud, I imagine it's probably a little bit better hearing it out loud, especially if you're just kind of like not just sitting here, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you're reading it and you're, like, you're doing something, driving to work or whatever, like, I don't know. I, t to me, I'd still be getting, like, frustrated in the car. I'd be like, like okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like uh, reading it in your mind, it's just such, it feels like such less description than it actually is. Well, also, like, in your head when you're reading it, you. I skip. Yeah. Like, you can, like, skip. You could skim. Um, I feel like you can also adjust your, like, the reading speed a skip, little bit. Skip and scan. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes, like, I'll be reading and, like, there are, like, certain cues, like, in the writing where you, like, the pacing changes. And so you just sort of automatically adjust to the pacing sometimes, so. Yeah, I mean, like, James Clavell, like, <clears throat> in his Asian saga, mm -hmm. there's some things that he gets super descriptive about. Especially when it goes into, like, policies and stuff <clears throat> or sometimes, like, political strategies. And not that I don't have an interest in that, but I can already see, like, where, like, this, like, when he mentions, like, this or this or whatever, like, I can see, like, where they're going with that politically. Yeah. So I don't need to read all this crazy in-depth, like, detail that he does for, like, an entire page. And one of his pages are a mm -hmm. lot of words. And so I just kind of, like, skim through that shit because I'm like, I get it, like. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brock and Sons are shit. Like, we get it. <laughs> um, I feel like we complain about description a lot, but it's, like, so hard when it's being read out loud, I feel like. Or at least I complain about description a lot. I don't know. It's hard because I'm, like, let's fucking go. Yeah. I don't know. It's... I also feel like it's one of those things that we're just, like, complaining about. But we would miss it if it was gone, maybe. That's kind of who I am as a person, probably. So you're not wrong, I would say. Because <laughs> then we'd be like, but well, fucking describe the cathedral to me. How am I even supposed to know what it's going to look yeah, like? Yeah, how do I even know what, what it's supposed to look like? Where's the description, Christopher Paolini? Come <laughs> on. <laughs> you know? Sounds like us sounds like you whatever <laughs> get out of here i'm not the only shitty one here oh cool laptop we got an update for you well okay. shall we <clears throat> say goodbye to our friends bookish i believe the best way to read these books is only through demi's recaps I was thinking, like, maybe I should put together, like, a whole oh my God. Just Demi's recaps. That would take a while, but I'd, I would do it. 
Damn. Could you imagine just like... That would take up so much storage space too because I wouldn't be able to go... <clears throat> I wouldn't, I don't have any of the older videos archived anywhere just because in the process of moving and two computers f- dying on me, <laughs> I've lost all the archive storage. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be so simple. I'd just go in and clip and like boop, boop, boop. But you have to download every single. I'd have video. to download every single episode from Aragon up until last year. Damn, that's a lot of that. I mean, I could download an episode, clip the section out, save that as an MP4, delete the full episode, go through it one by one by one. But that's just so much time of like sitting there, download, wait for it to finish, download, edit, clip. Where it'd be easier to almost fill my hard drive up with footage and then fuck or I guess I could run OBS and screen capture and then record that clip of recaps I feel like that would be a wild fucking video because they would all be just so wildly different with varying amounts of detail and accuracy fuck That would be awesome, though. (laughs) I'll start working on that. I mean, I got at least six months, so. Oof. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit. We should probably, like, end this. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for watching. If you guys would like to see a full Demi recap, like an Inheritance Saga Demi recap video. Like a compilation. Yeah. Drop it in the comment section below. <clears throat> if you like yes or no or yes or no <laughs> or yes <laughs> or no <laughs> or yes and uh i guess if it gets a lot of positive like yeah that'd be awesome then i'll actually like light a finder fire a finder <laughs> light a fire under my ass and work on it but if it's if people are like, nah, that'd be fucking dumb, a stupid, dumb idea, stupid fucking idiot, get dumb out of idea. Here. Stop. Don't tell ever... her, tell that girl to stop, to shut up. <laughs> Can't. Can't. Won't. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> Go to fucking Audible. If you don't want to hear us talk. <laughs> and we'll see you in the next one. <laughs> what an ending. Damn, I feel like I have so many things to say today. Today would be a good day for a podcast. Oh shit, baby. I mean, it's already six. I still have to edit this. Well, yep. I have to edit, render, post it, schedule it for tomorrow. So that's where my evening is going to be. My evening is.